Tanzania defines as suspect, the black and brown bodies, those who look like Muslims, as outsiders, as a threat. On the basis of this, the relation of the state to the nation was strengthened. Despite its failings, the state came to be accepted as the only force that could protect the nation against its enemies, both internal and external. This means that members of the nation are defined within Islamophobic discourse here in Canada as it played itself out. The real members of the nation, those endangered by the brown and black bodies among them, as members of a superior level of humanity, Western civilized. After all, it was Western civilization that these black and brown bodies were charged to be threatening. In this manner, the ideological borders of the nation were reproduced, even as support for pluralism, for diversity, for democratic practice was eroded. This recasting of national identity as white, of course, helped reverse the changes since the 1970s, when people of color in this country fought for inclusion in citizenship and actually accomplished a certain inclusion of Muslims as legitimate citizens in this country. The second thing that Islamophobia accomplishes, I want to argue, is that it helps to restructure citizenship itself. It helps to strip away the rights at this moment of Muslims, but setting a precedent that can be replicated. The denial of social services, education, employment to veiled Muslim women is a huge, huge site of contestation right now. This is an attempt to strip away the citizenship rights that Muslim communities and other people of color have fought long and hard for. Muslims migrated in large numbers after the liberalization of immigration and citizenship policies of the 1960s and 1970s to Canada, to Europe, to uh, the US. As a result of their increased access to citizenship, however, these immigrant communities were able to make significant inroads into the middle and upper echelons of the labor market by the last two decades of the 20th century. However, the economic restructuring of the period coupled with the social construction of these immigrants as outsiders to the nation presented significant barriers to their economic and political advancement. Nonetheless, significant advances were made in access to citizenship and its rights and entitlements. With the war on terror, Islamophobia as its central ideological platform, we see the move to strip away these rights. Citizenship is of course deeply contested. In Canada, Citizenship is based on the appropriation of indigenous people's lands and resources. So, certainly, citizenship as an institution is very, very problematic. It has been central to the colonization of indigenous peoples. So I'm not asking for an uncritical valorization of citizenship here. In fact, indigenous scholars call Canadian citizenship, quote unquote, the final solution. So I'm not making an argument here for an unquestioning celebration of citizenship. What I am arguing, however, is that this stripping away of citizenship in a very racialized manner makes it even more difficult for the thinking through and the transformation of this institution in a way that truly promotes social justice in a country, in a way that truly responds to indigenous people's struggles for sovereignty over this land. So Islamophobia, I would argue, has also been a setback for the alliances that could be built between social justice movements and indigenous people's rights for sovereignty. Islamophobia also at the global level is enabling the remaking of the global order on a basis that makes sense to Western populations. It furthers the neoliberal agenda of Western-led domination of the global economy push privatization and open the doors for greater corporate control of resources in the Middle East and Central Asia. And it does so in the name of the intervention for defending the human rights of women, Muslim women, in this particular case of Islamophobia, and in the name of furthering democracy, furthering civilization. While many in social justice movements have challenged this militarized privatization that's taking place, few have dared question the hegemonic discourse of human rights regime and the role 
that quote unquote, the civilized West presented to us as the model for all of humanity that is promoted by imperialist powers, taking these as transparently good in and of themselves. The human rights discourse, good, it's on the side of the saints, cannot be questioned. The West is the only model that is now available. If we think about the contestation that came from third world movements in the post-World War II period, contesting what was called Westoxification, and trying to put other models on the agenda, including other economic models, we hardly see any space for that kind of discussion in the mainstream media, and it's rarely there in the alternate media either. So what I want to argue is that all of the social justice movements we are a part of <coughs> need to think very carefully about the role we play in legitimizing some of these Islamophobic discourses and thus play an important part in furthering and managing dominant discourses, making them palatable on particular issues while reproducing other issues in very problematic ways. This means that we have to think about where the points are at which we have tried to disrupt this discourse, in what way have we disrupted this discourse, and what interests have been furthered by what we think as a disruption of this discourse. The intersection of racialization, Islamophobia, and imperialism has resulted in a strengthening of the neoliberalist ideology that underpins globalization, that underpins the war on terror, which is but a stage of globalization. While many activists have rightly challenged some of the racism that the war on terror has intensified, their response to Islam and Muslims has been to demonstrate solidarity only on condition of the reproduction of the secularist left traditions of the West and only upon the acceptance by Muslims of Western gender norms and governance practices. And we should remember that secularism is also a political doctrine of governance. To treat secularism as inherently and self-transparently something that is good and progressive is something that we have to really question and challenge. We have to recognize that secularism as a political doctrine of governance was incredibly important to the colonization by European empires of the 18th and 19th century. I find it very problematic that in many ways our movements have given legitimacy, however unwittingly, to the notion that the highly militarized neoliberal West has feminist commitments at a global level in fighting Muslim men's alleged evil and misogyny. They have given imperialist politics a feminist and secularist face and legitimized the claims that were being made by the state and media elites, including claims such as Canadians were in Afghanistan only so that women and girls can go to school. If every feminist and left activist in this country had exposed the racism and the colonial ideology that underpins such claims, that would have been a basis for a real anti-racist, anti-Islamophobic, anti-imperialist alliance. 